Good afternoon and welcome everyone to uh, another session of our Op COVID Science and Solutions and series, a year in review. It's hard to believe that we're a year in. Without too much upfront discussion, I, we have a jam-packed agenda today uh, following our session on respiratory protection, uh, filling the gaps. Uh, we wanted to get into some more solutions around elastomeric respirators specifically. So uh, we, uh, without uh, without too much introductory, uh, just a reminder that um, we would uh, welcome questions in the chat window. Uh, we are live streaming this session and videoing uh, recording. So we will be posting on our website following the live event uh, sometime next week, along with copies of the presentations for your for your general use. So again, questions uh, can be entered in the chat window. We are going to hold questions likely depending on our timing until uh, an entire panel can join us at the end of uh, the presentations today. Uh, and we will be uh, beginning with uh, moderated, the session will be moderated going forward uh, by Alec Farquhar. So I'd like to introduce Alec at this time now so that we can Please, as much of this uh, good content in as possible. So, Alec is a lawyer with a long career in workers' compensation and occupational health and safety, particularly around occupational infectious disease um, and employment of persons with disabilities. Alec's currently coordinator of Asbestos Free Canada and chair for engagement of the Center for Research on Work Disability Policy. Uh, previously, Alec was the director of the Office of the Worker Advisor and managing director of the Occupational Health Clinics right here for Ontario workers for OCAL. And actually, what makes his um, participation in this all that more impactful is from uh, 2005 to 2008, Alec was director of the Ontario Ministry of Labour Occupational Health and Safety Branch. And in that position, he was the uh, MOL operational lead for the implementation of the Campbell Commission recommendations and for partnerships with the Ministry of Health and health sector partners. This involved uh, him deeply with pandemic preparedness planning. And Alex played an important role in establishing the MOL's healthcare unit and Section 21 committee. He's a graduate of Princeton University and also has a law degree from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. So welcome Alex to moderate our session today. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, as most of you know, this is part of a continuing series of OCAL COVID web webinars. And really the objective is to connect the best science with frontline priorities, easier said than done. Uh, many of you also know we've recently had sessions on masks versus respirators, on ventilation, and on some of the medical issues around COVID-19. So I, I think we've tried really hard to bring you the most current, most vital information that will help you respond to what's out there. And we've had a lot of other sessions uh, earlier on throughout this whole difficult year of the pandemic. OCAL, and certainly I myself, believe strongly in an interdisciplinary and partnered approach. And we've really tried to do that with these sessions. Uh, I've had the privilege in my career, as Kimberly just mentioned, I've worked just about everywhere. When you're around long enough, sometimes that happens. So I've worked with the various OHS professions, with occupational physicians, with hygienists, uh, with ventilation experts, engineers, and many others. Worked with regulators, I worked with labor, worked with employers, and I've also advocated for victims, including victims of occupational disease, in fact, including victims of infectious disease. And I've seen firsthand the sometimes terribly negative uh, outcomes of inadequate prevention. So we're all here together in that common cause. It's a big tent. People have a lot of different perspectives. We recognize that and we're, we're trying to give tools that'll work for everybody. We're trying to foster a community here of knowledge mobilization and broad partnerships based on the science and providing the best possible tools. So we're really hoping that today's session will contribute to that. It is not a secret to anyone on this um, webinar that we are at a crucial time. The case counts are rising. The variants are in motion in a big, big way. Vaccination is months away from giving us herd immunity if that's possible. And yet at the same time, the tr there's tremendous pressure to reopen the economy, get people back to work. So it is a crunch point. We need the best possible tools and resources to protect worker health and safety. This session's on elastomerics. This is new territory, I'm sure for quite a few of you. 
Yet, uh, many people believe elastomerics could play a much bigger role in Ontario than they have to date. You'll be very familiar with the fact that shortages of N95s played a huge negative role in the early months of the pandemic. But at the same time, there are uh, serious issues around elastomerics. I think some people are frightened of them, unfamiliar with them, and um, really not so sure how they might fit in. And almost a form of uh, paralysis, a territory that people are hesitant to enter. So we're hoping that today's presentation will start opening some doors uh, in the workplace and uh, out in various sectors. We have four excellent presenters. What we're trying to do is to give you the sort of nuts and bolts of elastomerics, then a research perspective, and finally a frontline perspective. I, I, I think the combination is going to work really well. As Kimberly has noted, we'll hold questions for the end, but put them in the chat as they occur to you. Our idea is that probably some of the presenters will answer your questions along the way, and then we'll see what the most important remaining ones are. As mentioned, the session's being recorded. The presentations will be made available. Uh, it'll take a few days, um, but it will happen. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our first speaker. It's Todd, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing Todd your name correctly, uh, uh, Todd Eirich. And Todd's an occupational hygienist at Ocow. He's been at the Ocow Ottawa Clinic for around five years. Todd's a certified industrial hygienist with a master's degree in chemical to toxicology and occupational health science. It's a 30 year career working with industry consulting now with Ocow to protect the health of workers by evaluating hazards and recommending the implementation of control measures. So Todd's a really seasoned person who's worked in a lot of settings. He's going to be focusing on um, I guess we, we called it Elastomeric Respirators 101. And uh, I think you'll see it's all about introducing you to the subject and giving you a really good overview and survey. So uh, Todd, take it away. Okay, thanks, Alec. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here. And I'm going to uh, speak today, as, as Alec said, on uh, uh, elastomerics mainly, but um, to put it into context, you'll see that I, I delve into the other types because um, really to understand what elastomerics are, it's helpful to know what the other uh, broad categories of, of respirators are. And um, so uh, right there in front of you, you see a half mask, air purifying, negative pressure, elastomeric. Um, I'm going to use a lot of words like that. I'm trying to say them slowly, uh, and I don't expect you to, um, you know, remember all those because uh, it takes years to really get used to all the nomenclature. But you do, you will have these slides, and I, I try to include enough information uh, for takeaway that if, if you know what I say here in 20, 25 minutes um, doesn't, uh, you don't catch it. Well, I guess it's being recorded as well. Here we have a full face. Uh, elastomeric, air purifying, negative pressure, uh, both with uh, cartridges for filtering out particulate, uh, high efficiency particulate, otherwise known as P100s. So here's a typical, uh, like a little diagram of, of the makeup of a half mask um, elastomeric. And just a little uh, note, um, historical note that I thought was that I was trying to figure out, you know, where the word elastomeric came from. It's one of those combined words, um, elastic polymer, and it's a rubber-like material, and it's elastic uh, properties and resiliency, which means that when it gets crushed or whatever, it moves back, making an effective material for making a good seal around the face, which which is what it's all about when it comes to re respiratory protection. Well, that's one of the main things. Um, obviously the filtering material is one, but but it's gotta be a good um, uh, seal. And it's also resistant to many materials and uh, importantly as well, it can be readily cleaned and uh, disinfected. So you've got the, um, the face piece, which is the elastomeric part here, this cup, um, and key, key uh, aspect of, of elastomeric uh, air filtering respirators is the adjustable straps, both above and below. This one's got a nice ring that fits on the back of the head. And, and so these, these devices are critical in terms of 
um, help augment, you know, helping the elasticity and the good properties of the, the cone itself. And, and, you know, it, you really have to pay careful attention to how these are adjusted um, each time you wear it and certainly during your uh, fit test if you want to pass it. Uh, you'll also see the um, inhalation valves um, on the sides, which are going to be covered by uh, a cartridge and a filter, which I'll show you in the next slide. So here's how they attach on. And then, of course, the uh, exhalation valve, which um, has been getting some uh, attention in the healthcare setting. And I'll have a few words to say about that in a couple of slides as well. One of the one of the nice things that's been developed over the years, and again, uh, uh, you know, particularly with things like uh, when other PPE such as face shields or welding helmets are used, or or are, are, are called low profile cartridge options. And in fact, in in this case, you've just got the filter itself without a cartridge. Um, and and these are uh, you know low profile. So uh, as opposed to the big bulky cartridges that you saw in the first slide that I, you know, opening slide that I had, there is availability of, of, uh, of these low profile items. So this slide is a bit of a, um, something over the past year as uh, a hygienist who's been working in respiratory protection for over 30 years, and I've been doing quantitative, qualitative fit testing, I've been doing maintenance field, you know, I've, um, I just want to be very clear about the word N9, like the N95. N95 is the filtering media, it's not the respirator. And, and what everybody call is, you know, the, the general public and, and uh, you know, particularly some industries call um, an N95 is a filtering face piece, N95. This half mask air purifying respirator can be an N, have N95 cartridges on it. So in essence, it's a, it can be an N95 respirator, as can the full face. Um, in fact, even a tight-fitting full-face powered air pur purifying respirator, which uh, not the not the loose-fitting hoods, but the tight-fitting, um, is essentially the same as this full-face mask, and uh, it's uh, you know it could be fitted with an N95 cartridge. It usually isn't. It's usually a high efficiency, so P100. So that, that this P that this one could be a P100 or an N95, but it's a filtering face piece. This one could be a uh, N95 or P100. This one could be an N95 or P100. And it, they can all be other things, uh, which is the next, not this slide, but the next slide. I also wanted to throw in, um, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, articles that you read and talks that you hear, like you hear the European naming system for face filtering respirators, uh, the FFP2 and the FFP3. Those are pretty close to being efficient. Uh, equivalent to the uh, N95 and the P100 or, or N, and I'll get to the P and N in a minute, um, face filterings uh, the, in North America and, and uh, you, you know, a percentage or so off for percent efficiency, 95 to 94 for the uh, N95 versus the FFP2 and 99.97 versus 99 for the FFP3. Um, and, and remember that these filtering efficiencies are for uh, a 0.3 micron um, diameter particle. And also very important to understand that these are the filter media efficiencies and not the overall efficiency of a respirator that's worn by the user. That depends, sure it depends on the efficiency, but when, if you have a gaping hole or if somebody's got a beard or stuff like, you know, that's gonna dwarf the impact of this small difference between a percentage or two, um, when it comes to overall efficiency. So, so it's fine to have these great filter efficiencies, but you know, it's really important um, for, the, for the fit of the mask. So to, just to clear up the N and P, and there's even an R in there, um, which is kind of interesting, uh, but the N simply means it's not resistant to oil. So you can have an N95, an N99, an N100, and these are all NIOSH, US NIOSH, but the U.S. NIOSH, um, when it comes to this sort of material, that that you know, that's North American, like Canada. Uh, there's a there's been a very recent thing where with Health Canada, and you may have heard of the webinar a couple of weeks ago. But by and large, NIOSH approval is what's referred to, and um, and so P just means it's strongly resistant to oil, and you have the same efficiencies there. 
And like I said, and the R is like somewhat resistant to oil, okay? Uh, very, not, that's very rare. The, the, the most common ones are, you know, N95s and P100s, and they just happen to be, you know, one resistant to oil, one not. That, that, that doesn't usually come into play um, in most industries, but it, it can happen if you have an airborne oil mist kind of uh, environment. But again, just to just to re, uh, reiterate that all of these can be either in the face filtering face piece format or the elastomeric bridge, half mask or full face negative pressure air purifying respirator. So the other very key thing with elastomerics is the um, cartridge or filter that you put attached to the elastomeric face piece. And the most, most uh, common ones, um, I'll start with the middle, like, you know, the P100. So otherwise known as high efficiency, sometimes for it's called HEPA. So these are the 99.97% efficient at filtering out 0.3 micron um, particles. And uh, they can be just a pad like this. If you had an N95, it would it would be white and it would look like this pad more than likely. That that would be your most common um, uh, way of seeing an N95 on a, on an elastomeric. Um, and then this is a very a pretty traditional, typical, and the, also uh, the, you, you'll see these. So that the the color is magenta, so it's kind of like a pink color, and um, so that's that's you know it's certainly in the COVID application that's the most important one um, now. But when you're talking about cleaning and hazards for uh, uh, you know um, as associated hazards like quats and and other you know cleaning uh, compounds of ish, of note that could be health hazards, then you need your charcoal, you need your black for organic vapors. So if you and if you were a person. Uh, that was doing that was both trying to protect against um, the COV virus uh, and be doing some cleaning operations. Either you would have to change out or have two respirators or get one of these combined units. And the, the, the drawback there is that it, it does get fat, it gets thick because you have both the P100 and the organic vapor cart, uh, black cartridge. Um, so, but those are, uh, yeah, those are all options. And there's other, you know, so what you have to do when you're using elastomeric and choosing your filtering media is a, a hazard assessment of all the things that you might be exposed to. There might be ammonia around, there might be acid gases, you know, there might be other things. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there we go. Um, then I have down here, uh, just as a little note, um, you know, there, it's important to have a filter change schedule. Uh, the, the CSA standard, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, today, is, um, you know, says a qualified person has to establish that. Some of these cartridges have end of life service indicators. Um, there's like a coloration change. Um, so, but, uh, you know, a big issue is whether warning properties, uh, whether you can actually smell the, the breakthrough of the compound. You know that that's a clear reason that you you would have to change out your filters. But um, anyway, it's it's it, it's beyond the scope of a 20 minute uh, 20 minutes to get into the, all the details of that. But it is a uh, it's something you gotta keep in mind. Is is your uh, well certainly your cartridge selection, but also your um, maintenance and and care and use of that. Okay, uh, did I miss it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to just define a few uh, key phrases when it comes to, and this is not just elastomeric, by the way, now. This is also fa filtering face piece, so, you know, commonly called N95s, but the filtering face piece N95s, as well as the um, uh, powered air purifying and other air purifying respirators, and even uh, airline, so supplied air uh, respirators. All, all of these um, terms apply to all of the all the various different types of respirators. Okay, so the fit factor is uh, determined in, when you, and so we'll talk about quantitative fit testing in a minute, um, used to set a pass fail. Uh, so for filtering face piece um, and half mask elastomeric um, negative pressure, it's it's 100 is uh, 
the the fit you know the specified fit factor but for say a full face or a um an scba a self-contained breathing apparatus it could be it could be higher that's um the assigned protection factor is not a measure well it's it's based on measurements but it's it's laboratory assessments uh, done by people like NIOSH and and the CSA adopts them and that is a uh, for a specific respirator what um, uh, you know the based on the exposure guideline and expected decrease in air concentration outside the mask versus inside the mask so for both the um, filtering face piece N95 and the half mask elastomeric the assigned protection factor is 10, okay? Uh, they have the same protection factor. That, you know, just as somebody that's do, been doing this for a long time and, and a lot of field work, um, that always surprised me that, because I always thought that an elastomeric had a much better fit. It was more robust. Um, it had a, you know, it, it just seemed like, whoa, I can't believe that that doesn't have a higher assigned protection factor than the filtering face piece um, because it's, you know, it just seems intuitively, but it is. So it's probably, they probably are pretty close and they just decided to assign them the same. The workplace protection factor is something that's very, um, not nearly as common. Like every, anybody that does respirators, a program is gonna have to deal with fit factors and assigned protection factors. Uh, the workplace protection factor is based on actual um, concentration tests outside and inside the mask while the person is working, wearing a specific mask. So CSA standard calls this a simulated workplace protection factor. And um, as you can imagine, that that's, takes quite a bit of doing. And it's it's really more like a research project than, than it is day to day. But um, yeah, it's, it's still, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a workplace protection factor uh, for the virus, you know, uh, somebody went in and, and did inside and outside the mask. Maybe they are. Uh, that our, our next speaker <laughs> will will probably know that, but um, anyway, uh, that's a workplace protection factor. And the other thing, uh, terminology, you, you can see that I'm I don't think I'm hung up on it, but it's important to get our our words right on on uh, you know important uh, aspects of this. And people often talk about fit uh, fit testing and fit to wear are two different things. A fit test is either a qualitative or quantitative test to see if a respirator fits a person. Fit to wear means that you've been medically assessed that and you have an acceptable lung function and allow them to use a respirator. So, so the, the word fit is used in two very different ways when it comes to uh, respiratory protection programs. Um, okay, so now uh, the CSA standard has a really nice diagram here that shows the hierarchy of respiratory protection for the various classes of um, respirators. And the elastic, like I was saying earlier, the elastomerics can be down here. They're, they're air pur purifying half face piece, but also the, um, you know, what are referred to as the N95. So the filtering face piece N95s are the same category. They have a assigned protection factor of 10. So essentially just, just very broadly, don't, you know, um, if the concentration was 100 parts per million outside the mask with a fit fact, uh, a protection factor of 10, it'd go down to 10 parts per million inside the mask. Just, just, just as a con conceptual understanding of these numbers. You can see the powered air purifying helmet without a hood with no workplace protection factor, uh, you know, study um, is 25. Uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the loose fitting, um, uh, yeah. With, with the with the face piece, that's the one that the most common one that you see. But the powered air purifying um, ha full face piece uh, negative pressure, which is just it's tight fitting. That's the that's the standard for asbestos um, high like type three removals. If you're gonna if you're gonna do an asbestos removal in inside an enclosure, you're gonna have a a tight fitting uh, full face piece or um, a yeah, powered air purifying full face piece. So that's going to be either 50 or a th moving all the way up to 1,000 for a powered air purifying full face piece. And then the top is the, um, well, sorry, there's no, there's no uh, air purifying available at the top. So these are all air purifying options on the left here. 
and that and and then when you get into atmosphere supplying, you can have um, uh, you can also have airlines with the hoods with the full or half face piece, and you can have self contained breathing apparatus, which is like the firefighters wear. They have the breathing air supplied on their backs. So that that's um, those are the two broad categories: are air purifying and atmosphere supplying, and both of them could be elastomeric. Like all, like everything here can be elastomeric because it's the it's the face piece, either half mask or full face, that's made of that rubber that makes it an elastomeric. But by far the most common that in the audience that we're talking to today is going to be down here. This half face piece air purifying. So all of these things, uh, whenever you wear a respirator, it has to have an um, uh, you know, you need to do a fit test and you can have qualitative or quantitative methods. Uh, the most common qualitative methods are using the banana oil or isolamyl elastate. Make sure you're using the right cartridge on your respirator. It's got to be the black organic vapor. Whereas with saccharin and Bittrex, it's, it's a particulate. It's like an aerosol. So you wear, you're, you'll be wearing a P100 um, cartridge. For irritant smoke as well, you're going to be having the uh, cartridge. And uh, this is uh, the saccharin and the Bittrex usually has this head uh, piece on. And and um, and then for the irritant smoke, you could just blast it around. I'm going to throw out, uh, so you know what that smoke is? It's hydrochloric acid. Uh, it's, it's a titanium tetrachloride mixed with water vapor in the air forms this. And hygienists are or like, you know, bad for that. Sometimes they develop things. That's the same smoke tube that you use for ventilation studies. And yeah, it's hydrochloric acid. So that that's why it's extremely irritating to the user. One of the one of the um, disadvantages as you'll see down here uh, is is that um, on the qualitative side, you have to be able to sense the challenge agent. And it's very rare that uh, somebody can't, um, it's not all that rare that somebody can't uh, sense Bittrex or saccharin. Um, it's less rare isoamylacetate occasionally, but irritants smoke almost nobody. Although I've, I have in the field had on occasion somebody who, so when you do this, you, 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 you uh, put the smoke in front of their mouth and they're you know moving their head back and forth and up and down and at the end you, they take their mask off to see if they can sense it and the, and and this one guy like just he sucked in this hydrochloric acid and he did he was just looking at me he didn't he didn't sense that at all and i couldn't believe it um and i read i read after that because i was interested that there are some uh substance abuse situations where people get uh kind of like immune to the uh, the sm the irritant smoke. So, but anyway, that that is the, that's one of the disadvantages, right? Is um, people. So if you have a, a qualitative fit testing program and somebody doesn't has does not have the ability to sense any of your challenge agents, you have to go to quantitative. That's the that's your only option, really. Um, but they, it is lower cost qualitative. It's easy to. Train the testers. This the equipment is quite simple, um, and and it is agent specific. You got vapors versus particulate, um, and uh, but you're not allowed to use it with airline or SCBA. On the quantitative side, um, you can uh, the, the port account. It's a trade name, I realize, but it's so commonly used. It's basically a particle detector and, and a light scattering device, and so you have a tube on the outside of the respirator. And on the inside of the respirator, and you look at the difference. Um, usually, the dust in the in a normal office is okay. Um, um, and then, but sometimes you have to light a candle to get additional particulate to have enough of a background. And um, yeah, so the the big advantage is it doesn't uh, rely on the ability of a person to detect the odor, and you actually get a number. So for the qualitative, as you'll see in, in the uh, CSA slides um, tables. There, the uh, passing of a qualitative test is, arb um, I was going to say arbitrarily, but has automatically been assigned uh, a, a fit factor of 100. Um, whereas with a port account, you can get anywhere from like, you know, 150 up to 7 or 800, you know, depending on how the fit is. 
And um, yeah, so one of the one of the limitations, like it isn't, um, it is not Asian specific. In other words, it's based on a particulate. And as you can imagine, the mo a molecule of uh, isopropanol is way smaller than um, you know a particle that's being detected by the port account. So there is a uh, limitation there. But the, and the way they come around with it is by using these uh, what they call safety factors. So they so they they come up with what they think it ought to, you know, the the, the number ought to be, and then they 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 add a couple of uh, add a zero or two to uh, to come up with the fact that. An organic vapor is much more likely to penetrate that seal between the skin and the mask than a than a particle is. You know, a larger uh, micron, submicron particle, even. And it is uh, co relatively costly, and uh, you have to be quite well trained to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to be trained on both of them, but th this one's a bit more um, involved and intricate. So this one, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see. Um, I hope it's the the print isn't too small, but you can you can print it out. And and a lot of the stuff I've already said. Like if if you've got a um, you know a filtering face piece, for example, so your N95 filtering face piece. Um, obviously, you don't want to use banana oil because it's going to pass right through it. And you can't even use um, uh, irritant smoke. Well, there it says stannic chloride. Right, I, sorry, the, it used to be HCl, but it, but anyway, it's a. Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's still hydrochloric that comes off. Anyway, um, uh, but you can use the, uh, and that's what probably most people do is with the head, the hood there, and and the bit tracks or the saccharin um, for for the filtering face. And so for the uh, half mask, this is your elastomeric half mask, your elastomeric full face. Um, and and then likewise here. So you you can use the uh, isoamyl acetate when it's uh, organic paper, or the um, bit tracks in the in the saccharin when it's a, a particulate. And then uh, for quantitative, I mean you can use the particle counter. So this generated aerosol, that's that's uh, the, the generated aerosol and the controlled negative pressure are quite um, are not nearly as common as the particle counter, like the port account. This is where you actually have a chamber and you introduce the challenge agent and you uh, and you and the person sits inside. Um, whereas the chamber in a port account is just a an office, you know, or a room or a lab or something. So, but you can use the particle counter for basically all the types of uh, respirators. And the CSA standard has a really interesting, the facial hair is a big deal when it comes to fit testing for a number of reasons. Um, a, for passing the test uh, for sure. And they give unacceptable uh, pictures and descriptions of facial hair that are more than likely gonna make you fail the test. And in fact, a lot of people's programs, they don't even allow people to have the test done if, they're, if they've got some sort of facial hair like this. But there are there are the acceptable ones, and uh, even this stubble. The, the the problem with stubble is, um, you know, you're probably gonna if it's if it's too big, you're going to uh, if it's too thick, you're gonna fail your test. But the other thing is, people go to their respirator fit test annually, or you know, whenever things change, like you know, every two years or whatever, and they they pass their fit test with blue and colors, and then on. Now it's on Monday. And on Friday, they've got stubble or they've got something else. Like, you know, so it's uh, the fit test is really just a um, a really single shot deal, and and it's um, important to maintain the uh, integrity of the seal, obviously at all times when you're in a hazard zone. So the um, that's the, the those are the two main things that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, protection factors and um, and and fit testing, Th those are tremendously important components of um, what is as you can see here in this slide, the out essentially the program components of a respiratory protection program in the CSA standard, which I I highly um, recommend anybody that's that's involved or you know certainly responsible for. A respiratory protection program that it's it's an excellent document with lots of detail. They keep it updated, and um, there's even a section that I haven't looked fully into on on biohazardous agents. A big up, update 
Um, so that that's uh, something worth looking at in the constant context of, uh, you know, the pandemic. But um, anyway, so the, the the key aspects, like a lot of the classic things in a program or roles and responsibilities, hazard assessment, like that, that gets down to what I was talking about, what, you know, how do you select your, well, A, what, what level, um, uh, you do need a protection factor of 10 or 25 or 50. Um, what is the hazard? How many are there? Do you have great cartridges? You know, that gets into respiratory selection training. There's a lot of specific requirements for training. Um, fit testing, I've talked about quite a bit. Use, I've got a slide. Next slide is on use. Uh, I've got a slide on cleaning and inspection. Um, health surveillance, like I mentioned, being fit, not only have a fit test, but being fit to wear the respirator uh, and then program evaluation. So on use, um, you know, if we had we've had a couple hours, we could get into actual nitty gritty nuts and bolts of of how you know what you need to do with these uh, elastomeric rep respirators. But um, I'm just putting giving you the the table of you know the highlights here, the section headings, just to prompt you to look at things like breakthrough, uh, um, the skin issues, tight fitting, um, user seal check. Uh, when you do the leak test, when you put the donning and doffing, um, change out procedures. Um, yeah, so there's there's a good uh, a lot of information in this CSA standard. Then training, um, we get uh, you know like people that do the respirator selection have to have a certain level of training, um, fit in the fit testing and and uh, repair maintenance. So so there's a there's a very large um, maintenance, I mean, training component to uh, working with these respirators. And this is no way in heck you're going to be able to, but I did, um, it was, uh, you know, I was asked about uh, cleaning and, and disinfecting procedures. There's a very good and detailed section on um, cleaning respirators and disinfecting for uh, bioaerosols. So, so I suggest that you, uh, we're not going to go through this right now, but you you take a look at that as at least a starting, and and my notes over here on the side are cleaning and disinfecting must be compatible with the respiratory. So the elastomerics, although I said at the beginning, are highly you know they, they, they can withstand a lot um, a lot of beating, but they do have to be very well maintained, and they have to be um, and and you know you have to make sure that you're cleaning them with the right stuff. For uh, for a while we were. Um, you know, it was said that isopropyl alcohol wipes are okay, but then you know certain manufacturers came out and said no, you got to use uh, you got to use these other wipes, and, and it turns out it's a, it's actually benzone benzalkonium uh, chloride. It's it's a, it's a bot, but anyway, that's another. So we have to be uh, cognizant during our cleaning and maintenance and disinfecting of the um, health hazards. And storage, okay. The last thing you want to do is put a respirator in a contaminated area uh, that's contaminated with the hazard you're trying to protect against. So we use plastic bags. We put it in a separate clean area. Um, keep keep it away from things that are going to be you know do on the left hand side here damage the material itself. Extreme temperature and moisture can can damage the face piece and filters. You don't want any uh, to use any. Any filters or face pieces that have been stuck in a um, sea can, outdoor storage can with no heat or uh, humidity control, so they'll get uh, you know um, they'll get wrecked uh, by by just by storing them that way. So I do have um, there's the question of the exhaust uh, valve, and um, I, uh, my colleague. I just wanted to give you a time check. You're you're doing well. I just wanted to mention your. Yeah. I'm almost yeah. I'm Perfect. getting very close. Probably Good. five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So so this uh, recent report on uh, by NIOSH that that looked at valve um, uh, exiting exhaust valves from filtering phase piece. So there's your N95 uh, with no exhalation valve. You're filtering phase piece N95 with an exhalation valve and your surgical procedural uh, covering mask. And you can see, um, you know, there's not a, not a whole lot blowing out there. There's uh, quite a bit more blowing out, but there's a lot blowing out on the um, surgical mask and it's even blowing backwards. Like, so it's hitting hitting the sides and then sort of getting blown back. 
they try they 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 had three methods for trying to control this um, in the filtering face piece with the exhalation valve, and that was with the interior tape, an interior ECG pad, and um, an exterior uh, surgical mask over the uh, over the N95, um, and that was the least effective. The best was the ECG pad, and a close second was the uh, taped interior. Those these two were were pretty close. And last uh, thing, I, I I had a note to uh, you know communication. I know it's hard in elastomerics; like it's hard to speak and um, and filtering face piece for that man, mass uh, that you know uh, matter. Um, and and the only my only thing. That I can, in my experience, can it's probably pretty hardcore, and and I know half masks are going to be more likely than full face, but you can, you know you can get, and we had uh, radio transmitters installed for critical uh, communication um, device uh, activities, so so you can do that, um, and uh, and there's lot, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say more than that on communication. So in summary, um, I just wanted to wrap up by saying that um, this is my opinion that elastomeric characters may be used effectively as long as they're selected, used, and maintained appropriately. Uh, just to note that the assigned protection factor for a negative pressure half mask elastomeric is the same as a filtering face piece, so an FF95. A full face piece elastomeric um, has higher APF as do powered and uh, powered air, full and half, and loose fitting, powered air purifying respirators. Fit testing is uh, critical, and the most appropriate method, quantitative or qualitative, should be conducted by a competent, adequately trained person. Proper procedures for donning, doffing, cleaning, disinfecting, maintaining, storing are required, and a, and a great uh, resource and highly recommended as a program model um, with which with useful templates, procedures, and reference materials um, is the is the CSA 94.4. And that's it. I'm I'm done. Thanks very much, Todd. I don't know about other people, but um, literally in the space of 20 or 25 minutes, I feel like I've entered into the world of elastomerics, which was mysterious to me. I really didn't know much about them. You've given us a tremendous entry point. I want to um, note for everybody the extremely valuable role that CSA standards can play, and Todd just mentioned CSA 94.4, which is just a few years old. And I'm very involved with CSA. I'm on the Strategic Steering Committee for the Occupational Health and Safety Programs. And a big advantage if you're a union dealing with an employer, if you're an employer perhaps dealing with upper level management, Etc., is that a CSA standard gives you a very highly validated, formal, and we'll say, I guess, official type of guidance. It's not sort of a manufacturer's guidance or somebody who knows a lot about it. It's It's been arrived at through a consensus process where labor, employers, and other key stakeholders are involved. So it has a lot of authority to it and will help you, um, I guess, we'll say, market or sell uh, an elastomeric pro uh, program to the right people in your workplace. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to um, our next presenter. And you'll see how we've tried to structure this. Uh, Todd's introduced the, the um, uh, subject matter. And of course, we all know that that's uh, not necessarily the end of the story. Um, you really need to look at uh, essentially other aspects that may be challenges, uh, you may need to delve a little bit deeper, learn a little bit more about it. So our next presenter, and very, very um, uh, glad that she was available and, and could participate, is Margaret Sietzema. Margaret Sietzema is a PhD, a CIH. She's an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, working to advance innovations in respiratory protection. So we're really glad to have Margaret with us uh, with her high level of expertise and experience. She earned her MS and PhD in industrial um, following completion of her PhD. She spent a year working as a fellow in the research branch of the National Personal Protective Technology Lab, which is part of NIOSH. So 
Uh, it couldn't have been more appropriate for what we need today. Margaret's also very active at the professional level. She's past chair of the American Industrial Hygiene Association Respiratory Protection Committee. And her research interests are in the development of methodology for real-time respirator fit analysis and control banding approaches for novel infectious disease outbreaks. So you've got somebody who can really bring a lot of scientific expertise and rigor to this subject matter, which is also so important in getting buy-in. And what we've asked um, Margaret to focus on are sort of going, going deeper and maybe a little bit in behind what Todd has presented. Uh, looking at the latest science and research, fit test and training, storage and cleaning, some NIOSH updates, and implementation guidance. So uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Margaret, and um, looking forward to your presentation. Um, I wanted to start today's presentation with um, a huge thanks and shout out to Dr. Stella Hines from the University of Maryland. She's really the expert and has presented this information in a lot of places already. But unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here today, so I'm sort of filling in for her, but a lot of the slides in this slide deck are courtesy of her. So I just wanted to acknowledge her from, from the get-go. First off, it's really important to understand um, what percent of the healthcare population was used to wearing elastomeric respirators prior to the pandemic. And one of the most available studies in order to um, access this information was conducted from NIOSH in um, 2014 and 2015. And this study uh, sent out surveys through the American Association of Occupational Health Nurse, Nurses membership, and then also to all sorts of other professional nursing organizations. And they found that really only between 25 and 30% of nurses reported using an EHMR in the past year compared to close to 95% of um, nurses who were more familiar with wearing and using an FFR. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna use EHMR and FFR to describe the elastomeric half mask respirators or a filtering face piece respirator. So I'm gonna use those terms pretty interchangeably. Anyway, this study suggested that going into the pandemic, um, most nurses and healthcare staff would be pretty unfamiliar with resp health elastomeric respirators. So if a healthcare or organization wanted to switch, say halfway through the pandemic from using FFRs to the EHMRs, they would really have to implement a whole, a whole series of steps in order to train and fit test all of their employees. Um, kind of on the fly. And so that's just where we were at going into this pandemic. And I thought that that would be relevant for um, thinking about, you know, where we are in terms of starting. So Dr. Hines conducted this study comparing the comfort, communication, sense of protection, and confidence in protection based on fit testing or training between the N95 FFRs, EHMRs, and PAPRs, PAPRs. And you can see from this graphic that while the N95 FFRs scored highest in comfort and the ease of communication in, that would be these, these, top, these top two slides, the EHMRs uh, scored highest in the sense of protection and the confidence in protection. She also found that despite these lower scores in comfort and communication, users really preferred to use the EHMR respirators. So this was kind of like um, eye-opening in that people really think that the EHMRs are, are more protective than the FFRs. A few studies have identified that there's a need to ensure respirators are available at the point of use. If an FFR is available right outside a patient room and the EHMR that's assigned to you is located several feet away or in your locker or in some central storage location, you're never ever going to choose to use the EHMR. You're always just gonna grab the thing that's right outside the room and walk in when, when a patient needs you. So the, the ways that, we, that you can deal with this is, are either to have a central cache of respirators and then figure out a way to um, allocate them and get them to the point of use, or to give someone an individual respirator. So give someone, every single person, their own EHMR. And the Texas um, Center for Infectious Disease option opts to give every single employee their own elastomeric respirator. And they carry this respirator around in a backpack with them all day, 
all day long while they're working. So whenever they need it, it's right there on their back. Um, the employees there really, I think, appreciate this. They take those bags and they decorate them. They make them their own and they, they're just used to carrying them everywhere they go. Contrary to that, the Allegheny Health Network began implementing their um, elastomeric respirator protection, their elastomeric respiratory protection program using a shared device model by assigning EHMRs to maybe a floor. And then they switched to um, being able to provide respirators to every single person. At the end of the day, both methods have their pros and their cons, and if you choose a central cache and redistribute to workers each day, you need to figure out how many respirators need to be where and how will you get those to a location that makes them easily accessible to workers. There also needs to be a system in place to clean and process them in between workers. And if you give workers their own respirators, there needs to be a system to carry them throughout their day that does not interfere with their other job tasks, as well as additional training on the maintenance, disinfection, and use. So then we get to cleaning and disinfection options. Um, it's critical to understand the difference between simply just cleaning and, some, and disinfecting a surface. When we refer to cleaning in this presentation, I'm really talking about removing any soil or dirt from the surface. Um, whereas when I talk about disinfection, I'm thinking about removing any microbial agents from the surface. Microbial agents can be any number of viruses or bacteria. We saw early on um, in the pandemic, a slew of research that came out about how to disinfect and reuse filtering face piece respirators, including strategies of using hydrogen peroxide or UV light, but there was a lot less information that was available for how to disinfect and reuse elastomeric respirators. For both types of respirators, if you are concerned with how the filter media tolerate, you have to be concerned with how the filter media tolerate the disinfection process, but also how the elements of the respirator hold up. For instance, does the disinfection process alter the way the straps, alter the elasticity of the straps so that the tight fitting seal um, is compromised? And a few studies have looked at this, and I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of them here. One um, common study that was conducted in 2015 um, developed what we I often refer to as the Bessesen protocol. And the Bessesen study um, titled The Disinfection of Reusable Elastomeric Respirators by Healthcare Workers, a Feasibility Study and Development of Standard Operating Procedures, had participants first follow the manufacturer's guidelines for cleaning with no intervention, and then watch to see how many mistakes the participants made. Then they had the participants clean a respirator following NIOSH guidelines and counted again how many mistakes they made. Finally, they developed their own protocol the Bessus in protocol, as I refer to it often, and identified that participants made a lot fewer mistakes. This protocol is available um, if you were to just download the publication, but essentially it directs workers to first remove the filters and then dunk the entire respirator without the filters in a bucket of soapy water, use a soft brush to remove any debris, and then move that respirator into a second bucket that has a diluted bleach solution where they let it sit for a few minutes before removing it and allowing it to dry. Um, it's important to note here that this study did not look at the effectiveness of this process to um, disinfect respirators. It did not like inoculate them and then count how many you know organisms remained on the respirators. But really the study focused on just the development of the protocol and training and how to train workers to follow it. Another um, consideration when you're thinking about elastomeric respirators is making sure that the material does not degrade in any way. The Applied Research Associates conducted a study looking at reprocessing of reusable re respirators. Here they first inoculated the masks with H1N1, which was allowed to dry, and then they cleaned and disinfected the masks. The hospital washer disinfectors were operated at a much lower temperature than they normally operate at due to the upper limit of the temperature for the silicone material of the masks. The Applied Research Associates also demonstrated a significantly lower virus recovery when compared to the respective control by following this protocol. It should be noted that in this same report, the ARA also tested a cleaning and disinfecting protocol using soap and bleach and found that 
This method was to be effective at removing H1N1 from the mask and also the surfaces. The straps of the elastomeric mask were the hardest to test um, just because the material is hard to get influenza off of. But they did do a lot of tests looking at durability of the masks after testing and found the masks to hold up to the process through multiple iterations of disinfection. So kind of like in, in summary here, when we're thinking about virus removal, we wanna make sure that the virus is eliminated from all of the surfaces. And uh, you can do this manually by, you know, using, um, putting the mask in a bucket and kind of scrubbing it clean. And the fabric surfaces like the straps are much harder to test for effectiveness of virus removal. And we don't really see too much of a difference between cleaning alone versus cleaning plus disinfection. And then you also always need to test the durability and um, the ARA report, which is highlighted um, is summarized in this publication from the American Journal of Infection Control, um, shows that, you know, it passes all of these durability tests after 150 cycles and four out of five models passed all of the, the durability tests when it was automated in, after 100 cycles. So we can see that these really do hold up to the disinfection process. Now, one thing that's being evaluated and a lot of people might ask are, can't you just wipe the respirators clean? Again, Dr. Hines research was the first to look at the effectiveness of using disinfection wipes on the surfaces of reusable respirators. An important note is that this study was conducted on a papper, but for our purposes, we can assume that the silicone material is that that is very similar to an EHMR. In this study, she first um, contaminated the masks with influenza via a spray and then used a series of different types of wipes or cleaned them first in soapy water followed by cleaning them with wipes. The respirators that were cleaned and wiped showed undetectable, cleaned first with just the soapy water and then wiped with a disinfectant wipe showed undetectable levels of influenza while the respirators that were simply only wiped clean with a disinfectant wipe had significant reduction in influenza, but it was still detectable. This study shows that you shouldn't really only use or only rely on a wipe to clean the elastomeric respirator. For practical purposes, if you're thinking about how you might implement this in a healthcare setting, it might be easiest to disinfect the respirator between patient encounters with a wipe. So you come out of a patient room, you use a disinfectant wipe to clean your elastomeric respirator. And then at the end of the day, you might wanna implement a way for the healthcare workers or put them in a central cache where you do a full cleaning protocol in you know, dumping them in a soapy bucket and then moving them and dumping them in a bleach bucket to really disinfect and make sure that it's clean for the next day. Now, this is a lot of information is also a lot of, um, the process requires a lot of steps and it needs to be very carefully orchestrated in order for the successful implementation of a elastomeric respiratory protection program in a healthcare setting. So we have to remember that going into the pandemic, not very many people were using elastomeric respirators. And so everyone was used to walking into a patient room, grabbing an FFR, using it for the patient encounter, coming out of the room and disposing of that FFR. And now all of a sudden you have to implement and think about all of the strategies to clean and disinfect the EHMRs. And so it's just a lot more work and we have to be conscientious of what we're asking the healthcare workers to do. Who is going to be responsible for what and how are the respirators moved around the hospital? What other PPE is worn when you're disinfecting the respirator because you know you we have to then think about gloving and how, you know, the protocol for removing the gloves. And those are just some of the questions that you need to answer prior, prior to implementing these. So then we can talk about the filter cartridges themselves. What about the respirator filters? How should they be cleaned? So again, that, um, the applied research associates or as outlined in the American Journal of Infection Control, they, did the similar experiment looking at just disinfecting the filter cartridges. And they found that cleaning alone with just the wipes 
um, either a neutral detergent or a disinfectant wipe was able to remove all of the virus that they put onto the outside of the filter cartridge. It passed all of the filtration efficiency tests afterwards. And so what we learned from this is that you really only need to change the filter media, the filters from the respirator, if they become wet, soiled, or otherwise damaged. Um, slide talks about microbial persistence on filters. So oftentimes we have people asking questions along the lines of, but you know, these aren't just particles, these are viruses and viruses are alive and they can move and can't they go through the respirator filter material? But we know that once a particle sticks to a filter material, it does not come off of the filter material. Um, Gardner demonstrated this in a paper about viable viral efficiency of N95 and P100 filters from 2013. And he, they demonstrated that they're very effective at preventing viruses from going through the filter material at all. So practically what this means is once the virus particle attaches to a filter part, a filter, um, to the filter, it's, it's lodged there. If you take a deep breath in, you're not going to dislodge the, the viral particle. It's not going to be, you're not going to be able to inhale it in. The virus is not able to wiggle itself free. Um, even though it's alive and it, this is just, this picture is just from a video produced by minute physics that's available on YouTube. And I think was pretty widely circulated. I don't know, maybe about six months ago. And if anyone hasn't seen this video about how an N95 filter works to prevent particles from moving through it, it's a, it's a really great explanation. And I would highly recommend you view it on your own time. It's both very informative and easy to understand. So, if anyone's looking for, you know, how do N95 filters work, I'd recommend this, this video on YouTube. This is actually um, from the CDC guidance on the, for contingency situations for filters. And what they say is that filters, so just like we saw two slides ago, filters, except for the unprotected disc type um, or pancake style, so that's this filter on the left side that doesn't have any sort of case or covering around it. These may be used for an extended period if the filter housing of the cartridge type is disinfected after each patient interaction, provided the disinfectant or cleaning agent does not come in contact with the filter media. And the concern here is that if you're wiping a filter media with a disinfectant, that you could then reduce the efficiency of that filter. So you, it's good to disinfect the casing of the filter media, but you don't really need to disinfect the filter itself. And then they go on to say that filters, even cartridge types, must not be dipped or immersed in any sort of cleaning or disinfection solution because this may damage or render the filter media, media ineffective. When using a cleaning or disinfectant wipe on the external surface of a filter cartridge, users should avoid contact with the filter media on the inside of the, con of the, of the cartridge. All right, so that's all about availability and then cleaning and disinfecting your um, elastomeric respirator. But like I said, at the very top of this, in order to implement elastomeric respirators where there were none before, you have to come up with a strategy to fit test and train healthcare workers in kind of a just-in-time setting. And there's been one publication thus far published on this by Lisa Pompey and it was published in JAMA in May of last year, and they had 193 healthcare personnel. Um, they put 153 in the elastomeric uh, respirator group and 29 in an FFR group just as a control. And what they found was that 92.2% of EHMR users were able to pass a qualitative fit test on their very first try, and that's compared to 88.5% of FFRs who pass on a, the qualitative fit test on their first try. Um, both groups used approximately about the same amount of time in order to pass that fit test, so it didn't take any longer for an EHMR user to pass a fit test. And then I have, um, this is, there's kind of a lot of information on this next slide. It's all of, it's one of the data tables from this, from this slide, but they also, in this study, looked at um, a variety of performance metrics. You know, they evaluated, you know, did they inspect it properly? Did they do their positive and negative seal checks? Were the straps in the right place? All of these things, and you can see them here. And then they counted how many mistakes they made 
Um, and you can see that in, on their first attempt at donning the EHMR respirator, they um, got 72, I think they're, the total possible score was 78. And they, you know, on average made six mistakes in their first attempt. And then by the second attempt, they um, their total performance score was 76.4 and their third was 77.4. So all they really needed was a single donning with a little bit of instruction, and then they were performing the, the protocol almost flawlessly with very few mistakes. As Todd mentioned, there is a little bit of concern regarding the exhalation valve of EHMRs. And this is just um, one study that um, has been conducted where they used a variety of different face coverings and so the top one shows an elastomeric um, respirator with a surgical mask covering. The second one is the elastomeric respirator with no covering. And the third one, the, you know, then we have just a N95 mask, a surgical mask, and um, no, no face covering at all. And what they did here is this was their experimental setup. They had a person kind of standing there and then they had these agar plates kind of part around the room. And when they had the elastomeric respirator covered with the um, surgical mask or when they had it uncovered, they in all of these situations, they there were no they, detectable, nothing grew on the agar plates. Um, so we don't really see any increase in um, source you know, in particles generated through the exhalation valve when compared to an N95, even when you cover up the elastomeric respirator. Now, I wanted to just um, highlight that NIOSH has two, they have, they have, there's a couple of websites available. So the first website is that in these, if you have the actual presentation from me, these are active links. So there's a NIOSH elastomeric website, and this is just kind of a screenshot of what's on that website. And then there's a CDC elastomeric strategy page if you wanted information on CDC implementation guidance. Um, on the NIOSH elastomeric website, um, there's all sorts of research that's ongoing for NIOSH. So you can see kind of where publications might be coming out or what they're actively trying to pursue and research questions they're trying to answer. And the CDC strategy page just highlights um, what to do, you know, from a CDC global point and how, how to implement these. And then speaking of implementation, there are NIOSH contracted with Maryland and Dr. Hines, and then also with Allegheny Health Network to develop an implementation strategy. And Maryland's implementation guide is fully published and available. It's on that NIOSH link, and also it's linked right here directly, where they take you through, I don't know, it's 50 or 60 pages of step-by-step -step if a hospital wanted to implement elastomeric respirators, how one would go about doing that and the steps you would need to take. And um, Allegheny Health Network is has a paper published, and I think that they're also going to come out with an implementation guide similar to the Maryland one, where again, they just tell you how one hospital's experience and exactly step-by-step -step what they did and how, how they converted from using FFRs to using the EHMRs. So those are worth pursue, perusing if anyone is interested in like, you know, converting to EHMRs but isn't sure how to do it. And that's um, really all that I have for you today, um, a brief synopsis of a lot of the EHMR research that's been happening in the last several months. But if anyone has any questions, feel free, this is my email. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, I think you can see why we we thought of Margaret for this uh, key presentation. What, what you're mapping out is sort of like the next level uh, underneath what, uh, what Todd was mapping out. I think people will see there are there are challenges, there are technical issues, there's a need for rigor, there's a need for a program, but also that if you can get it working properly, you've got a tremendous resource at your disposal. So now um, we're going to take the um, factual and the theoretical and the research uh, a little bit closer to the front line. We have two presenters uh, and I, th I think what I'll do is I'll introduce them both now 
so that we can segue directly uh, and then uh, that might help a little bit with um, time for questions at the end. We're running really well on time. In fact, we're two minutes ahead of time right now, which is highly unusual, as you'll know, for any Zoom call that I've uh, heard of. So uh, again, um, also a real feature of these OCAL webinars has been the um, cross-border collaboration and the international collaboration. So here's Margaret from, uh, from the States. Prior to that, Todd from Canada. And the next group will mirror the same thing. First, we're going to have Mark Kaplan. I think someone needs to be uh, muted. I'm not sure who. Uh, Mark has 40 years of experience in industrial hygiene in the construction, environmental, and healthcare sectors. So he's had a deep, deep uh, history uh, experience in a lot of uh, a lot of sectors, which makes a huge difference. Because as people will know, elastomerics are probably they were first used in um, real dangerous frontline settings like construction. Mark retired in 2018 as Occupational Health and Safety Director for the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, which is also a union that's in Canada. He has a long-standing interest in improving respirator use in healthcare, including the use of elastomeric respirators, and he was recommended highly to us, uh, actually by Dorothy Wigmore. In 2018, Mark presented on reusable elastomeric respirators, healthcare worker perspectives, in a pretty prestigious venue, the U.S. National Academies of Sciences Committee on the Use of Elastomeric Respirators in Healthcare. And I want people to think back. He did this in 2018. What if uh, it had gotten a bit more uptake? How, how different could things have been uh, from really the disaster that uh, befell, especially the United States, but also Canada, just two years later? Then we have Paul Sylvester. And what we wanted was to have a senior health and safety representative from one of the major Canadian unions, which might be uh, have at least some members uh, interested in trying out elastomerics. So we reached out to Paul. Paul is a highly respected, very experienced uh, health and safety representative with our Canadian Union of Public Employees with their health and safety branch. Paul provides knowledge and support to CUPE members in the workplace sectors of healthcare, social services, municipal, school boards, and post-secondary. That is quite a list of frontline hazardous jobs right there. Paul is a board member of Ontario's Workers' Health and Safety Centre. And for those not familiar with uh, the centre, it's a very major significant source of uh, education and training to workers and employers across Ontario. He's a member of the province's Section 21 Healthcare Committee. That's a committee established, actually, I helped establish it myself under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and it brings together employers and unions in the healthcare sector for uh, joint problem solving on key crucial issues uh, like this one. And Paul's also on the Provincial Working Group on Health and Safety for the Education Sector. So you're getting somebody who's really deeply um, rooted in what's really going on in our province. Prior to working for CUPE, Paul worked for 25 years as an education worker with the Conseil Scolaire Catholique uh, Providence and was an active member of CUPE Local 4299, which is in Windsor. He's received awards from the Windsor and District Labour Council and the Workers' Health and Safety Centre for his activism. He's working out of CUPE's regional office in Markham, Ontario, but still calls Windsor home. And his passion lies in consensus building among stakeholders towards better health and safety conditions for everyone in the workplace. And his interests include being a marathoner and a musician. So without further ado, we'll hand it over to Mark and then it'll segue directly into Paul. Thank you both. Well, I'm I'm really honored to be here and with the with my wonderful colleagues and these wonderful presentations to, to start off this webinar. So I want to sort of look at uh, and and talk about the experience I've had in in working with a number of different healthcare facilities and organizations unions on issues of last Americas. I've been, as Alex mentioned, I've been uh, an advocate for this uh, for trying these out in healthcare for a long time. But at the beginning of the of this pandemic, it struck me that this was a really important issue and maybe an opportunity to really change uh, the respirator use in healthcare. So. Um, to move my slide forward. Okay, I want to go back in history just, just for a second here. So we go back about 30 years 
And uh, uh, as as our OSHA in the U.S. started to look at healthcare infection control issues in the early in the early '90s, issues of tuberculosis and, and uh, uh, were growing. And and R NIOSH came out with the, actually the first guidance uh, ever on the use of respirators in healthcare in 1992. And this is a cover of the face of the document for um, healthcare facilities for exposure to TB. And this is a, say the first time healthcare employers uh, saw NIOSH had this interest. And this is actually what they recommended because of the precautionary principle, they went with no air purifying respirators, but all air supplied respirators. And this caused such a huge outcry among uh, US healthcare employers that NIOSH actually rescinded the document. It's no longer available. And, um, and a few years later then approved the use of, of FFRs and N95 respirators for healthcare for tuberculosis, and that's become certainly the standard for, uh, for infection control in healthcare. What's interesting though is, is there is one facility, and this is, and uh, this has been, Margaret mentioned this earlier, this Texas Center for Infectious Disease, which is a sort of unique public sector TB hospital, they uh, never moved to N95s. When, when, when this was being looked at in the late 90s, and I've, I've been down to see their facility and see how this works, and it's really impressive. They, um, they, looked, they looked initially at the cost, and the cost of disposable N95s and the amount of they would use, it, it made more sense to them to go to elastomerics. And so over 20 years ago, they moved into elastomerics and um, have, have not switched. Once they began using the elastomerics uh, for cost saving, uh, what they realized was these were a much better protection than N95s, and the management and the staff would have told me they would never go back, and they're puzzled why other healthcare employers uh, don't at least look at uh, elastomerics. Okay. Uh, after we, we saw a number of healthcare facilities after H1N1 because of the uh, uh, shortages and blockages that we you know that we've seen at a massive scale in this pandemic, but in 2009. We saw after that we saw a number of facilities moving toward potentially using uh, elastomerics. Our 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 Veterans um, Administration, which is our largest hospital system, had several uh, several occupational health staff who were champions, and and really pushed the the VA into considering the use of elastomerics, including this purchase of sixty five thousand elastomerics, um, and an idea of an idea that they would use is at, across the U S. Uh, unfortunately, um, those champions left the VA, and and reportedly the VA then disposed of these sixty five thousand respirators only a few months before the pandemic began because of the expense of storing these, and they had no intention apparently of using these. So this is a, another case I think of uh, you know missed opportunity here. Uh, this is an interesting early model of a respirator designed for healthcare use. Uh, as an elastomeric with these plastic removable covers to kind of direct air and, and allow for better and easier disinfecting, but the manufacturer discontinued discontinued these. Um, Margaret mentioned the Allegheny Health Network, which I think is a good example of a of a early system in the in this pandemic that because of, of anticipated shortages of N95, they moved into elastomerics early on. And they were lucky in that Pittsburgh is the Headquarters of MSA Corporation, and they worked, and they they had a contact there, and were able to get uh, a supply of of, uh, of elastomerics, and they they've been uh, moving in in the direction of expanding the use of these. Um, this is the one facility that I'm aware of that's adopted N90 that's adopted elastomerics that's actually represented by a union. This is SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, and although the union wasn't involved in the initial decision to um, to adopt elastomerics, the union has been uh, heavily involved in the implementation and dealing with issues, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So I think, and and they're very happy to talk to other other unions and folks about their experience, and they've been very supportive, as have their members, about the the use of these uh, of these respirators. Okay. Um, and uh, and there's been, as Margaret mentioned, there's been this good article. One of the things I've been impressed by is the University of Maryland with Dr. Hines and and the and the Allegheny Health Network and uh, and the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, they're all very generous about sharing their experiences and and their programs and plans. And so, if you're interested in these, I would you know you can reach out to us and we can put you in contact with those folks. Okay. Another major center uh, of the many that I've been talking to is the University of Colorado Hospital, which also adopted elastomerics early on in this pandemic. Um, 
And and um, their their kind of rationale for doing it was was a little different. Their their academic their medical director had 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 been involved in a lot of emergency response and and hospital decon issues over time. And um, after H one N one, he had purchased with with some money that they uh, had for emergency response the eight hundred elastomeric respirators, which went into their stockpile and hadn't hadn't been touched. And he remembered those when uh, when this pandemic began and pulled those out of the stockpile and they started using those in some of their most highest used areas in the emergency department, ICUs, and then with staff who were moving across the facility and were more mobile. And um, and that and, and then they've been, they've been purchasing more and more to spread the use of these across their facility. They they uh, his report was they were very satisfied in many ways with these with these um, use of these respirators, but he wasn't sure if they would continue to use these after the pandemic was over. And I think that's a big question that we may see if there may be uh, facilities that are adopting these, but then abandon these and go back to N95s once the once this emergency is over, and I think that would be a, a, a large mistake. So we, we see different models of, 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 uh, of elastomerics, and so there's certainly not just one model that's, that, that could be used out there, but these are the kind of ones that these facilities have been, have been using, and I think there's, you know, they have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, Margaret mentioned this issue of the, of the, of the uh, filters that have covers versus those that don't, because if the, the filters without covers have to be replaced more frequently, the ones with covers can be replaced less frequently and they'd still be decontaminated. And, and that just makes the program easier, okay? Um, my experience um, in this area of respirators and, and, um, and infection control with, within healthcare, there's been, there's been a longstanding uh, uh, objection or, or, or questioning about the use of both respirators uh, but but when we got into the use of elastomerics, we we saw some of these repeated and some new problems here. So one of the one and so I think I wanted to just go through these three major ones. So one of the issues that I always hear about is well the patients are not going to like these. They don't look like surgical masks. They're going to scare the patients. And I think that we've this is probably not uh, not anymore an issue because we if you when you see news reports of of uh, of, of of healthcare responses on the pandemic, you generally see some people in the, some of the workers having elastomerics on because a lot of facilities uh, have, have allowed workers to bring their own respirators in when there were shortages. The Joint Commission here encouraged facilities to let people do that. The state of California had, had mandated that. And so we saw lots of, lots of healthcare workers bringing in respirators from, that were from their spouses and friends who were construction workers or industrial workers. Uh, so I don't think this is a problem. And if you thought it was a problem, there's ways to do patient education to to uh, to alert the patient as to why their caregivers are wearing these un unusual looking masks. Also, it would often hear that these elastomerics are uncomfortable to wear and they interfere with communication and work. And, and that's a reason not to use them. But I think the problem that I see with that is, is in my experience, this is true of all respirators, N95s and all other types of respirators. They're all uncomfortable. Workers, you know, wearing these, it's not like working without these. They're, they're gonna interfere with communication and tasks. And I think that's a, the, the solution to that is really the needs for hands-on practice and allowing people to not treat these as just-in-time devices, but to allow healthcare workers to practice and to come up with solutions. Um, nurses I've worked with will, will talk about the uh, interference with communication that they run into initially, but they work ways around it with both using exaggerated facial expressions to communicate, learning to speak louder and more clearly and more slowly, and then, you know, dealing with in other ways and, and allowing them to continue to do their work. So this is not a problem. I think that's not, it's not a problem that workers and wearing any respirators uh, have across sectors. Okay. And then the final one, uh, and, and Margaret had mentioned some some of this, is this this issue about these reusable elastomeric respirators would spread pathogens and and be a source of uh, a source of those problems in a healthcare setting, and I think that we've seen uh, both before and during the pandemic that disinfection is possible and there's a, but there is a real need for employer proper planning for this employer support and employer oversight. Um, so uh, I, I I've seen a number of facilities where they've simply done a quick training for workers on how to disinfect their N95s with disposable wipes. And then they sort of walk away and then later say, well, nobody's doing it right. And so there's really no, there's really a lack of employer uh, support and oversight doing their work as, as employers. 
And the other problem that, at least here in the States that I've had is, is given the acceptance of hospitals, infection control professions and others on the extended and, and reuse of N95s and, E90, and N95 decon policies because of shortages, I think this is an issue. This is not an issue we should be debating anymore around elastomerics. These can be decontaminated. These can be reused. They're not going to be a source of spread if employers set the programs up right. Okay. And as our previous speakers have mentioned, if we this is our U.S. Uh, OSHA respirator standard. And if you if you are using N95s and you have an ex, you have a good respirator program already, you're already. There's not a whole lot that you have to do different if you're going to adopt the last numeric. Certainly, there are maintenance and care issues. There are training and informational issues and cleaning procedure issues. But um, a lot of these elements really can easily be adopted from your current existing program. Now, if you don't have a good respirator program, then that's, you know, this is going to force you to do more. Uh, and so I just, so this issue of training and, and fit testing has already been Margaret's already discussed this. Uh, same thing with the fit testing protocols are 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 the same. Um, the one thing I think that's important to look at two things here. One is is one of the things that we see with fit testing is as healthcare uh, providers had problems finding the N95s that they initially were using, they were moving to different types of brands and models. And each time they do that, they're required to refit test people. So we saw, we've seen facilities do multiple fit tests over the course of the last year. If you would have started with, N, with elastomerics, you would have fit tested people once, and that would have been it for the whole year. And, and on the issue of user, uh, user seal checks, I think um, I've never found it easy to do user seal checks with N95s, which gave me any sense of comfort if I'm wearing these. But with elastomerics, it's easy to show workers how to do this. It's easy for workers to know that these respirators are fitting fitting well. And it gives, I think that's that's where I think the sense of of that they're getting better protection from the earlier studies that uh, that Dr. Hines did, I think is where that, some of that comes from is because of the ability to know that this fits well. And and I think really the, the the major issue that we've seen are are really issues of decontamination and then how you make sure these are available. And there are these really two opposite poles and then there's hybrid models in between. So the Texas Center for, for Infectious Disease uses a very decentralized model that's worked for them for 20 plus years. So when you come on staff, you're issued your respirator, your fit test, your medical approval, you're trained, you're shown how to clean, disinfect, and care for the respirator, and and you're given that respirator. And uh, and then you're expected uh, to take that with you and and use it. And you're also expected at the end of the day to to uh, to do the care and uh, cleaning. And if you need help, to get help from management. Now they've they've the management has put the uh, respirator program in their respiratory um, in their in their um, in their respiratory care department and their staff which I, we had a chance to interview, have are really knowledgeable on respirator issues and, and all the things that need to be done to keep these respirator programs working. And they're, a, they're not a large facility, so they're, they're, they're able to really go around and, and do good audits and do checking and ask questions of the, of the staff so that they have, I think, a very successful use of this in a decentralized way. Um, what we find, I think, is, is that Nurses and other healthcare workers really like this decentralized model. They like to to know that this piece of equipment, this elastomeric, is theirs, and they're the only one wearing it. And I think that that if you can move to that, I think there's advantages from the staff perspective. But it also brings problems, um, just in terms of of oversight and and storage and and uh, and keeping them available, as as Margaret mentioned earlier. So the uh, University of Maryland uh, has a has a much more uh, has a much more centralized program, as you'll read if you read through their materials. The Allegheny Health Network, as Margaret mentioned, they began with a decentralized system at the beginning. They they provided these elastomerics to a small number of staff in high use areas, and uh, and then they've been expanding that use. And they're they've been moving to a more uh, centralized system. Um, I think that they're one of the concerns that the union has had is this moving to a centralized system and having people now wear, you know, the, the, the correct uh, brand and size respirator, but not wear the exact uh, individual unit that they had on before. And, this, um, and there were concerns about that. Okay. Um, and if you, and the Allegheny Health Network started out with monthly uh, filter changes to be cautious when, when most other facilities that I'm talking to are doing annual 
filter changes or filter changes when, when there's breathing trouble because something's gone wrong with the filter. And then the University of Colorado Hospital has also done a sort of a centralized system. And they started out with that. They, they, um, they have some, uh, uh, some personal, they have some people who are given their own personal respirator. These are mostly staff who are mobile and move around the facility. And then they've been moving to a more, a more centralized program for, for staff uh, that are at their department. And so there's a, there's a mix of, of what individual users do during the day and during their shift. And then there's central cleaning, disinfecting, uh, inspection and and repair occasionally, and I've been seeing this hybrid model seem to be spreading. There's a large um, healthcare provider here in the states who may be switching nationwide to elastomerics, um, uh, and I'm hoping we'll hear about that at some point in the near future. But what they're doing is actually using a, a decentralized model at the uh, at the at the department level, where uh, an individual worker will get a respirator. An elastomeric, there they will be trained to care and, and disinfect and use it, uh, and they will use it for maybe a week, and then at the end of that time, then it gets shipped off to central supply for a for a, a good independent cleaning re inspection and and then return back. Um, so so the key is really figuring out what's going to work at your facilities and then making sure that you can deal with all the issues that it, that it makes it that that make this happen. The the facilities that I've seen where the where the piloting of elastomerics has failed is where they've really not really not addressed these issues and and didn't seem to really involve frontline workers. And I think this is a this is an example of the sort of a, a simple backpack that that they use at the Texas Center for Infectious Disease. So you you're assigned this and your respirator goes in there and all the parts and, and supplies you need go in there and you wear this and all the staff wear this and so as you move around the facility it's always available. Most other uh, healthcare facilities, you know, have an issue, a problem with where, where to store these things because there's always a shortage of space and how to make these so they're readily available for staff. And but I think that if if there's an involvement of frontline staff, uh, as in, you know, as with uh, SEIU Pennsylvania and 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 other places, I think some of these problems could be could be resolved. Um, you might have a variety of solutions across the facility. So I don't think you have to do the same thing everywhere. You know, we, we've certainly seen elastomerics focused on emergency departments, infection, uh, ICUs, um, and, and a few other departments, uh, uh, anesthesiology and, and, uh, and such, people that are, that are kind of hitting, you know, having major use of N95s. And so, um, but I think it's also key that after you involve frontline workers and come up with a plan that there has to be support for both the staff um, and and audits and and uh, and oversight by the employer, like you would for any healthcare program, any respirator program. And Mark, I think I, just, I think it's. I just want to give you a quick time check. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm almost finished. So. Uh, so I think it's it's good to go back to this uh, National Academy of Science report because I think this is a very good report looking both at routine and surge use. Uh, there are other good documents here in the U.S. This is actually on the NIOSH website, but this Hospital Respirator Protection Program Toolkit that the state of California developed initially after H1N1 and then uh, and then has has been revised and added to with OSHA and NIOSH, but that's available. And I think they talk about the use of elastomerics also. And then I think it's 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 interesting to um, to think about something that's happening now, which is I think the the new sorts of respirators that can be used for healthcare that haven't been used in the past. And Margaret showed this clean space. This is actually PAPR, but a really interesting design that I that's and there are designs like this that are used in Europe and Australia. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, you know the MSA has recently come out with a elastomeric that has no exhalation valve to kind of deal with that. That often raised issue that I don't think is real, but but at least there 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 are people coming. There are respirator manufacturers now looking at the healthcare workforce and and different types of respirators and coming up with new designs. And I think we should keep encouraging and supporting those efforts. So I'm going to end there and be glad when we get to the question and answers to talk more. Okay. So thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. And we'll go straight to Paul and try to finish by uh, right around a quarter to two. So we'll have a, a decent stretch of time for questions. Okay, thank you uh, very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here uh, to provide a, uh, some frontline feedback that I got from uh, some QP members uh, in healthcare on the use of elastomeric respirators. What I was really trying to concentrate on are those who you know, before the pandemic had really not um, 
uh, hydrators either had were wearing the the filtered face piece respirators before, and they made the switch over to the elastomeric respirators. I'd like to acknowledge those QP members that helped me uh, that informed this this presentation, uh, and also I'd like to uh, thank them for uh, all healthcare workers and the frontline workers and all the workers that uh, during the pandemic have been uh, faced with uh, uh, in numerous challenges and PPE certainly has been one of them. Uh, it's important to remember that when we think about personal protective equipment, we have to look at, uh, remember that it is always considered to be a uh, an at the worker uh, means of controlling the hazard. And when we think about controlling the hazard, it's best to keep in mind some of the criteria for effective hazard control. Uh, if any of these criteria are not met, you know, additional controls must be implemented to supplement the control measure that you're implementing. So when you're implementing uh, respirators, you know, you have to ensure that the uh, the respirator is eliminates or adequately controls the danger to workers or the hazard that may exist, and that the uh, the, the hazard control must protect all workers likely to be exposed and not leave any other workers vulnerable. And when you choose controls, you must ensure that they not they don't create new hazards or have unintended negative consequences uh, that develop. And uh, key to this also when we think about PPE is that it should allow the worker to work without any undue stress, discomfort, or heat. Uh, and that uh, hazard controls should, uh, they should not impair dexterity, mobility, or vision. And as we're going to, uh, we've heard from uh, some of the other presenters, uh, it should not impair speech as well. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and also the final thing is that it just must not create a hazard to the environment or to a third party. And when we think about the use of N95, uh, the filtering face piece respirators, we can think about certainly some environmental hazards that have been created on that, on that in that respect. So when we think about using in hospitals that have never, they, they might've already have a respirator program. It should be, as Mark mentioned, uh, fairly simple just to update the program to include the uh, the elastomeric respirators, uh, but there is, you know, uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic and, and there are certainly uh, a reason why, uh, there's certainly many reasons as we've learned today, why someone needs to, um, why, why, you know, healthcare settings should be implementing elastomeric programs. Uh, but you, if, if not, you just consider pilot programs and trials and I, you can identify, you know, the high risk, low risk, the easy or difficult areas where you can implement these. But it's really important and essential to have uh, worker feedback and consultation throughout this this trial or pilot programs when you're bringing in the uh, the respirators. Uh, and the Drug Health Safety Committee, you know, uh, should be you know consulted uh, during the development and implementation uh, to provide that that essential feedback that needs to be there. And it, in opportunities exist in many levels of uh, direct patient care and support. Uh, for most QP members, uh, they have never ever, you know, had an elastomeric respirator before. They might have uh, a lot, of, uh, a good, uh, a large majority of them have uh, had an N95 and gone through the fit testing, uh, and probably never had to start wearing them until today, uh, until you know, until now, I should say. Uh, so, but we have seen them used in previous outbreaks. Uh, and in the intensive care units. Uh, but previously, you know, we would only see them uh, regularly used amongst the trades and technical workers. But it's important to remember that they're, they're, they're important as well outside of uh, ICUs. Um, there was a, a study from the uh, uh, universe, uh, some hospitals in Birmingham, Birmingham, UK, which noted that uh, seroprevalence uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, was higher in workers and environmental housekeeping uh, and in acute medicine and general internal med medicine when compared with those that were in the ICU uh, units to show that, you know, those, even though the people in the ICU are, of course, that are at a higher risk, uh, risk certainly exists uh, to uh, other workers as well within the hospital and that they should be included in uh, elastomeric respirator programs as well. 
Uh, so key to from the feedback from the workers was uh, training was uh, essential uh, when implementing the programs. And we've heard about the use and care and the, the disinfecting process and all that, but it's it's really key, they said, to really know what are the limitations of the equipment. These uh, these last numerics don't last, you know, forever based on the amount of use uh, and the amount of cleaning and disinfecting that they go through. So there's wear and tear, and that is often forgotten. So workers will really need to know when the equipment is starting to fail, and the best way to know to do that is through those seal checks. Um, that it will help identify if these. Uh, you know, whether the, uh, the, the respirators are, are functioning or not. And when they're going through the training process of using these, it is, it is vital that they go through a run through of their tasks and duties to ensure that um, their, uh, whatever tasks they're performing, uh, find out if, it interfere, if, the, if the respirators are going to interfere with those tasks or the other way around. Will the, will the respirator interfere with anything they're going to do in, in their daily operations? Something that could easily knock off the mask uh, in the process of what they're doing. Um, so donning and doffing, uh, it was expressed that there is a uh, quite a bit of, um, it, it could be time consuming. Uh, to don and doff an elastic elastomeric respirator when compared with the filtering phase piece respirators. So there are, are methods to do it by yourself or with assistance, as long as you're going through the donning and doffing process uh, carefully to ensure that you, you take the proper steps to avoid contamination uh, with, the, with, with, with the equipment. And although communication uh, has been identified as a problem, it, it is not only just for elastomerics, built, you know, the filtering phase piece respirators also uh, have those communication problems. So it is best to seek out the brands that have the speech diaphragms where communication between colleagues and communication between patients is, is vital and is key. Um, so there are, there are different, uh, uh, what we've heard today is that uh, there are single wear options and shared equipment options. Uh, just ensure that there's a process for logging the use and remember that the parts can wear out quickly if you're sharing equipment. Uh, and if they're being sent out more frequently for, for, for cleaning and disinfecting, uh, all that transport and handling can wear out the parts quickly. Uh, so for filters, cartridges and shells, uh, process for logging them with specific end dates. And any kind of process that these masks go through, uh, you're gonna have to log and have a serial number attached to each respirator so that they know how long they've been used, how often they've been cleaned, uh, so that there is a good uh, inventory uh, of their use. From the worker's perspective, uh, comfort was, uh, compared with the, uh, the filtering face piece respirators, what they note, noted was comfort was a, a huge step up. And uh, they, know, they noted less pain from uh, uh, pressure points uh, on the face. And that uh, they, they noticed less resistance when breathing. Uh, depending on the type of filter, uh, some will give you less uh, resistance than you would normally would with the uh, filtering face piece respirators. Hey Paul, and, just a yep. time check to get yep. to some questions, just to checking in. Thank you. Uh, what they also noted is that in certain healthcare settings, they were getting respirators from unknown sources, uh, and they didn't know, you know, who was supplying them, if they were donations or, or where they came from. So, at least we know what these last neck respirators is that we know it's a reliable source, and we know where it's coming from. Uh, we're coming directly from the manufacturers, and be mindful of the fact that accommodations may be required because not everyone will be able to fit test. And they can be used in the broader healthcare. However, as uh, Mark mentioned, there could be a perception from pay patients and residents uh, outside of hospitals where they might not understand why someone is approaching them uh, to understand why are they wearing this particular this particular piece of equipment because it is associated, you know, traditionally with the chemical industrial settings, uh, and that the um, there there may be a negative perception there as to why this why this person is wearing that equipment. But uh, 
with familiarity with regular use with public education, uh, that familiarity can, can uh, there, that, that negative perception can be waned. Also, I had the chance to speak with uh, EMS workers who have been wearing it for many years, uh, and they are, you know, they, they have single use. They, they use it on, I shouldn't say single use, they are the single wearer of the equipment, uh, but they have programs that are, are available. They've been using them, many uh, services have been using them for the last 20, 25 years, uh, and they have different variability of calls, and so they have to carry around different levels of cartridges and filters based on the, uh, the exposure. And that um, uh, because they're exposed to the elements, that frequent seal checks are often required. Uh, I listed here some resources that will be available uh, when the slides are posted. Um, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll turn it over for questions now. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, Alec, I'm going to read you some questions from the chat. Uh, and then we could try to take some live as well, but just to get through some, Jennifer was going to do this for us, but her power is out. So can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> Thanks a Alex? lot, Kimberly. Okay, so um, there's a couple of questions around the, and we've dealt with this in some other sessions, but for um, so the differences in inhalation or filtration resistance with respect to the chosen filter media. So over to you, Alec. So. I wonder if that should maybe start with um, Margaret and perhaps if others know about it and have comments, how's that sound? Um, I mean, I think all of the filters after disinfection or have been, they, they've been tested and it appears that the disinfection protocols do not um, affect the filtration efficiency. They still pass all of the NIOSH certification standards for, for their given filter. Even the newest MSA respirator that doesn't have a exhalation valve, so now instead of breathing out through the exhalation valve, you're breathing out through the filter media, that still passes the NIOSH certification tests and is a certified respirator with regard to the filter resistance. Could I add a question to that? I think for Margaret, maybe, or Mark in particular, um, Simon Smith in a previous uh, session told us that it was actually easier to breathe in and out of an elastomeric for the user because the um, the overall area of uh, filtering material was was larger than on an N95. Maybe could a couple people comment on that, Margaret, start, but then if, if Todd or, or Mark or Paul, uh, it's really important if, if that's true. I would definitely trust Simon. <laughs> so I if he if that's what Simon says, I would trust that because he is coming from the manufacturer's standpoint. So Todd or Paul or? I agree. I agree with that. What's my... Maybe, maybe if there's somebody. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Simon, you could comment because that was sort of news to me. And of course it made sense the minute you said it. Maybe explain a little bit because this is important for people. Oh. Where, they're, where the users are having trouble breathing through the N95s. Sure, yes. Um, I think in uh, um, the first presentation, you saw some different designs of filters, the e-capsule and the, also the, the round open type that was recommended for use. Those encapsulated types, you see some of the filters are rectangular. They employ a pleated filter media. So in, instead of being a flat sheet, it's, it's like a concertina. Uh, shape and so you can accommodate a lot higher surface area within that uh, configuration than uh, obviously with a flat configuration. That means that the uh, it has a wider area to pass through, and so the efficiency will be increased, and also the resistance uh, will will go down. It's like try, trying to breathe through a, a straw versus you know a, a wide pipe, that, that kind of same same issue. So um, that that's one way they can be offering uh, lower airflow resistance. And I know some that are on the market, it is it, possible that you cannot even tell you're wearing, well, say, wearing a filter or not. Uh, you can try it with the mask with the filter on and filter off, and you won't notice a difference because there's a certain threshold which people don't know the difference. So the advantage is that way. And thank you, Simon. Any thoughts about extreme sweating conditions? So can sweating affect the seal of an elastomeric respirator from another uh, question from the chat, Alec? Let's, um, I'm wondering if, if uh, especially Mark or 
especially Mark or Paul might have a sort of user perspective on it. And then maybe we could switch to see if uh, uh, Todd or Margaret or Simon has an insight on that. That's another really important element to this. Yeah, this is this is Mark. Yeah, I I mean my experience in other settings is is you know really hard work and sweat, and you know and the you know the growing stubble on the face and a lot of things can affect that fit while while a, a worker is wearing these respirators. So, so that's got to be built into the program to try to to try to uh, to deal with those issues, you know, build in build in breaks when possible, uh, and 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 uh, other uh, other ways to make it easier for workers to wear these successfully. Yeah, that is that is exactly what I was uh, what I what feedback that I got as well is that there are heat issues, but they noted that with the with the the elastomeric respirators that um, it wasn't as irritating to the face that when you had heat with the filtering face piece respirators, a lot more irritation, uh, and the seal was uh, was it went away a lot quicker than it did with the. Uh, with the elastomeric respirator, they were able to uh, keep the seal a lot longer. Uh, however, what they had recommended and what the General Safety Committee mentioned it was more frequent breaks. Um, for our EMS workers, they they were being asked to do more seal checks more frequently if because of the, the, the different levels of uh, environments in which they deal with. So it, heat will uh, definitely affect the... Uh, the Okay, Kimberly. Yeah. yeah, there was a discussion, a question for Margaret, um, but she invites others to join in about bleach and quats being toxic substances um, and uh, obvious and have linked links to asthma. asthma. Um, so asking about um, hydrogen peroxide and similar less toxic uh, or benzyl peroxide uh, for use on elastomerics. And let's start with Margaret, and then if there's anyone else who's got some knowledge about the cleaning aspect, that would be really helpful. Margaret? Yeah, so I, in the, during these presentations, I pulled Stella's paper back up, and she looked at isopropyl alcohol, the um, hydrogen peroxide, a quaternary ammonia, and also bleach, and found all of those were pretty much equally effective at um, disinfecting for influenza. Simon might have a better answer for this, but I've always heard that we're not supposed to use alcohols on elastomeric respirators because they can degrade the silicone material. So I would, um, if those are the options, I might head towards the hydrogen peroxide. So if someone else has any other information, feel free to chime in. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the CSA standard said, uh, quotes the World Health Organization specific chemical germicides Stabilized hydrogen peroxide, 6%, uh, peracetic acid, variable concentrations, sodium hypochlorite. So, but to your point, um, you know, all of these things, like I think probably from my perspective, hydrogen peroxide is the least in terms of causing a secondary health hazard uh, from, from what those are, you know, the, those that are listed. Uh, isopropyl alcohol for sure. I was taught early on, and probably from Simon's group, not to use, uh, and I think I mentioned not to use the alcohol wipes uh, on the surface. But the substance, it was always those, um, what were the, I think they were a, a benzalkonium chloride uh, disinfectant. Right. But anyway, I'm just uh, letting you know what the, the CSA standard says. So, so yeah. can I comment here, Kimberly, and maybe get, get Mark and Paul to weigh in on this because it's really important. You can imagine someone who's a user who's really used to using an alcohol wipe for lots of purposes, and it just translates over, and then of course doesn't work out very well. I'm just wondering if Mark or Paul have comments on just how you work it into people's thinking at the front line. Well, well, I, I know with uh, my discussions with nurses from uh, the union at the Allegheny Health network early on, they, they were running into trouble from both their fit testing and early use where there were uh, people getting rashes on their faces. And you know, they initially were thinking latex in the, in, the, in, the, in the face mask, and that turned out not to be the case. But then, so the issue is what were they using for disinfectants? And then they had to, to modify that. Uh, but they were alert to it. They responded to the complaints quickly and they, and they dealt with it and didn't seem to interfere with the acceptance. So. Comments from Paul? Yeah, I, I would don't forget. I would, I would reach out to the manufacturer, find out what they recommend, and also if they are if they recommend say bleach, which you know can be caustic, that uh, work with the manufacturer to determine if there's other uh, you know uh, so you can substitute other 
um, cleaning methods and uh, ensure that the workers are, you know, are up to date and with their WMS and they know exactly with what they're working with and that they have the, the proper environment to do this, this kind of cleaning. I'm going to try and throw two in one here and just to get us through and there was some talk about, you know, is, is there increased concern for adverse effects? So people are having allergic reactions or integrity breakdown with elastomeric respirators. So is, um, that along with uh, somewhat similar because I'm, I'm, I'm going dual here, trying to shove it in before the about um, concerns about the size of seal and, and test checks for small handed uh, persons. Uh, so there was a question. I know those are kind of not unrelated, but I wanted to see if I could fit them both in. So one about adverse effects on skin, integrity, breakdown of the last American, one on the seal test with uh, smaller hands. So who'd like yeah, to I, start off on that one? If I can jump in, Alex, if that's okay. So there, there are uh, there are there are ways to use uh, to use gloves or some other other materials to supplement if the hands are too small to cover up the filters for the seal check. So that's that's not a hard problem to solve. Um, and the other issue is I've, I've I've not seen too many problems with these uh, with the more modern elastomerics. We used to see with old fashioned elastomerics and latex, uh, but the the modern ones are pretty stable. And I think the facilities that have been using these for a long time are seeing that. You know, a well-maintained elastomeric respirator is going to last a year before it even start before there's degradation, and that's usually when they change them out. But they may even last longer than that. So, um, any comment, maybe if Margaret or Todd from, um, especially from the research, is there if there's studies on this or anything? Yeah, I don't really have it? anything extra to add right now. Okay, Kimberly, any more questions? Done really well. We've got a lot of questions out here. Yeah, there is a lot um, of discussion that has been answered as we go along, but we we do want to uh, speak to the elephant in the room. So there there is, uh, you know, a lot of commentary and question around whether shortage actual shortage of elastomerics versus N95s. Um, so whether this was a supply issue as we've discussed, or whether it's a um, you know availability issue, supply issue. But people are asking, was there a shortage of elastomerics? Um, I think many of us uh, versus N95. So we'll, we'll put it out there. I think it would be good to have this from the Canadian settings, at least first, if Todd or Paul know anything about the shortage issue. My impression is there's not a shortage issue, but anybody know? Uh, Simon might know too. There, there, there are, I, I'm not sure of like, when we talk about supply, Currently, there are obviously way more N95s that are available than elastomeric. So, but there there is supply out there of elastomerics for specifically for healthcare, and there's no reason why that they cannot be implemented. And you know, we Canadian Union of Public Employees has been pushing this particular equipment uh, uh, at our Joint Health and Safety Committee levels and at our labor management uh, levels as well, and at our provincial levels, uh, but you know, these are, I think it's a bit of a familiarity issue with a lot of, uh, a lot of people is that they're, they know what they're getting, they know the models in which they're fit tested for. And uh, I think in the middle of a pandemic, I think people are, uh, there's a perception that we'll stick with what we know before venturing into something that we know. But I know from experience that I've spoken to workers from the, uh, from the hospitals within Unity Health in Toronto, who uh, made the switch over in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and because they saw that there was the, uh, it, it was it was a win for everybody as far as cost, as far as comfort, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it up to to others who might have uh, more comment on this. Maybe maybe Mark could comment how that has played out in the states because, if, if anything, the health impacts on healthcare workers have been even worse there. Yeah, there, uh, there, we did see shortages in the first few months of the pandemic because a lot of the manufacturing plants were in Asia and, and they were hard hit by the early pandemic. So, but more recently, we're not, I mean, I, I've talked with a large national healthcare employer who purchased 80,000 in the last few months and they're getting their supply. And I've talked to small healthcare systems in New York City that are adopting it. And so they're, they're, no one's reporting that they can't get them. They might, you know, take a little while to get in, but the supply seems to be there. 
the supply issue is actually uh, not a problem. There's just the government of Ontario alone has had 100,000 in their government stockpile since June. They're just refusing to distribute it. And they've actually helped dozens of lots of manufacturers in Canada and the U.S. And there's millions available, but there's no there's no demand for them because there's no uh, information being shared by the pub to the public by the uh, governments. We appreciate all the speakers and I really wanted to give great thanks to Simon Smith and for joining us. He helped get um, uh, contact connect us with Margaret um, and our committee, our small committee of Kevin Hedges and Alec Farquhar and Todd and Simon and um, and connecting with all of you. Uh, so, again, I hope this really helps everyone and I just want to hand it back to Alec and thanking him immensely uh, for uh, some closing words. So thank you everybody. I think you you can see that this session's really delivered on everything we hoped it would. Uh, starting with Todd through Margaret, Mark and Paul, and then really good questions. And people will be aware, I think, from the chat. There's there's background here where there's a lot of frustration that um, we we couldn't have moved this faster through the system. And I think you've seen some of the barriers. I personally really hope this session would contribute to the future as well as the current situation. Uh, that uh, we won't be caught flat-footed at this. And it, the lesson seems to be a lot of attention to devil in the details and the need for a good program, for buy-in, for working effectively between the employer and the union, the Joint Health and Safety Committee. If we can, if we can pull that off, then we've got a pretty important protection for workers that is sitting there ready for us to use much more widely than it's being used now. So I hope this session has contributed to that. We've had a really great turnout. Thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend. Don't forget to check out our um, sessions upcoming April 9th, a uh, year in review, and uh, April 23rd. I've, I've attached the link again. Thanks, Kevin, um, and take care and have a great afternoon, everyone.